This is the most humble day of my life. In July of this year, hundreds of journalists descended upon London, or in Channel 9's case, a helipad near London, to cover the biggest media story of the century. Rupert Murdoch had taken the extraordinary decision to shut down his most profitable newspaper, and the even more extraordinary decision to keep his least profitable one open. The phone hacking scandal that engulfed the news of the world was symptomatic of a broader decline in ethics and news values across the world. Newsrooms are shrinking, and sub-editors have been laid off. Reporters now have to file more stories more often in a world where the content of Zoo Weekly and News.com.au is barely distinguishable. A world where, despite their appearance, print journos are now making videos. And where media proprietors who on their deathbeds once uttered Rosebud now just utter the words Pippa Middleton's ass. Welcome to the Hamster Wheel. about what's making news and how the news is made. For the next eight weeks, we invite you to step inside the cage with us as we take a good, hard look at how the media works, or in some cases, doesn't work. Yes, and uh, to help us do that, please welcome the most valuable member of the team, Horace the Hamster, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful thing. I think you might have been taking a few growth hormones yeah. there. It's the, uh, it's the weirdest studio desk since Alan Jones presented Alan Jones Live from behind a parrot. <laughs> yeah. Or indeed, Andrew Hansen presented Strictly Speaking from behind a turkey. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's probably best to think of this show as a kind of low-rent alternative version of the government's media inquiry. Not that anyone thinks we need an inquiry. What's wrong with the media? Good question, Ron Wilson. Here's one answer. Also today, more Dachshunds than you can handle. Thousands of competitive sausage dog owners put their dressed-up pooches on show. <laughs> Good story, but let's, let's put aside these fluffy colour pieces about dogs and move on to the big political story of the week. Our Prime Minister is celebrating her 50th birthday with the gift of a puppy. A puppy and jewellery. Still young enough for some puppy love. There's speculation about the name. Mm, speculation. <laughs> but look, I mean, reaching the big 5-0 is a very important milestone mm. in anyone's life and was the perfect chance for the PM to reflect on everything she's achieved over the years, you know, back in her 40s, her 30s, <laughs> and even all the way back to her 20s. Mm. It uh, seems like just yesterday. <laughs> also in politics this week, the big stink continues over Channel 9's attack on the pokey ma machine legislation mm. during one of its rugby league broadcasts. Yeah, and look, I'm totally with Andrew Wilkie on this one. I mean, I think 9 crossed the line. First, commentators reading blatant lies Mm. ads and then the video referee got in the action. Did you see this? Yeah. During the grand final on Sunday. Check this out. This has got to be tried. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Shameless. Absolutely shameless. <laughs> they have no morals. We also had the uh, the big announcement this week of course that Angry Anderson is running for politics. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. Which is, it's great news because the last time a bald ex-rock star <laughs> ran for office it worked out so well. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, Labor actually has a secret weapon here. Behold, the musical weapon that Labor's going to use to take on Angry Anderson, song for song. We know how to play the game. Side by side, we stick together to uphold the magpie name. Just forget about the internet. They should put a filter on Stephen Connery. Yeah. <laughs> Angry Anderson follows in the footsteps of boring and forgettable Anderson by joining the National Party. And when it comes to politicians, I think Angry talks a lot of sense. But none of us are politicians, thank uh, thank, thank, uh, thank, thank <laughs> beware of those that aggressively seek office. What, like people such as you, Angry? <laughs> now, now, critics have been quick to come out against Anderson's credentials, and I totally agree with them. I mean, Canberra is no place for an ageing, washed-up rock star. Yeah. The place for an ageing, washed-up rock star is the AFL Grand Final. Yes, nothing defines the sheer athleticism of the AFL more than a fat, sweaty old man called Meatloaf. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I loved his, uh, his tribute to all the AFL sex scandals this year when he started shooting that fat little penis into the crowd. <laughs> 
I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> That's football in a nutshell, though. But on the field, it was all about Geelong. Uh, just a great effort by the Cats, uh, particularly Travis Varco. Although at the end of the game, during the medal presentation, Andrew Bolt seemed determined to rain on his parade. Oh, Look at that. Oh, yes. the, uh, the Andrew Bolt <clears throat> defeat in the federal court was the feel-good media story of the week. <laughs> yeah. But a uh, terrible outcome for freedom of speech. Yes. I, I think it was Voltaire who put it best when he said, I may disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Even though it's factually wrong, you only used Google for a search and the whole thing had a snide, nasty tone. Didn't know you spoke French. That, that's the rough translation yeah, yeah, from the original exactly. French. Well, although, although I've got to say, I disagree with the court. Bolt should be able to use provocative language. I mean, he and I are at one on this issue of free speech, which is why I'm sure Andrew Bolt would not mind a bit when I call him a <laughs> <laughs> Is that just beeps? It beeps. <laughs> They've got the sensory in us now. Those ABC lies are such overcautious little c**ts, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> Now, the main reason that the Bolt lost the case was that he made so many factual errors, uh, as Bolt himself admitted in these four words of his 1,500-word post-defeat article. <laughs> Although he also said they none seemed to be of consequence. Yeah, not of consequence. Man, Bolt was so loose with the facts that he's been offered a place on the Australian swim team with Kenrick Monk. <laughs> it's interesting what Bolt was saying, though. His argument was that fair-skinned people had chosen to identify as Aboriginal yeah. later mm. in life to get some kind of professional advantage. Yeah, yeah, because if you had wanted to gain advantage in Australia, you'd clearly choose to become an Aboriginal. Yeah. <laughs> but despite Bolt's uh, ranting and bleating, the law actually in question doesn't actually constrain any opinions so long as they're reasonable and based on fact. Even racist opinions, even opinions about Aborigines. Right, so if I wanted to say, for example, that Jeff Clark wearing a possum pelt outside the court made him look like a total knob, that's, that's OK. You can say that, absolutely, because Excellent. it's an opinion based on a fact. The fact that he looks like a knob. <laughs> it's, it is a complex minefield. It is. It is. It's very complex discussing race. It's the same with the refugee debate. Mm, I yeah. always find that incredibly hard to follow. But here on the hamster wheel, we're here to help. Each week, we thought we'd explain a difficult issue to you in a language much better suited to the modern attention span. Yes, yeah, so here then is the refugee issue in a nutshell, told through the power of YouTube cat videos. <laughs> Refugee policy has been a tough balancing act for the government, especially when their East Timor solution was rejected, leaving them hanging. Asylum seekers have traditionally been held at Christmas Island, despite attempts to scare them off. But when the government started to go down in the polls, an appetite developed for the Malaysia solution to stop the boats landing in Australia. But the High Court slammed this as unlawful, sending the government into a tailspin. Gillard had to choose between onshore processing with mandatory detention or she could negotiate a deal with Tony Abbott. She closely looked at her position and leapt straight back onto the Malaysia solution, leaving Graham Richardson very unimpressed. Labor now waits to see if its new attempt to pass the Malaysia solution doesn't go the way of all its previous attempts. It was the show that got all of Australia talking. Now, six ordinary refugees will be forced to confront their own prejudice as they embark on a personal journey of understanding and go back to where Tony Abbott came from. I hate Tony Abbott. I just don't like anything about him. They'll be taken to the places that formed his worldview, from his church. Uh, I don't know how any living person could do that every week after week. To his university at Oxford. They face so much brutality here. It's unbelievable. Right back to the privileged private school where it all started. Oh my God, look at that weird headdress. Maybe this is not good. We need to stop the butters. Because you can't understand someone until you've run 20 miles in their shoes. They're going back to where Tony Abbott came from. I've been just seeing camera that completely changed my mind. No one should live in a hellhole like that. There was this story about a young missing girl, presumed dead, although we, we couldn't be sure. And the editor, he asked me to do what I could, you know, to, to go the extra yard. And uh, now, I have hacked phones before, but this, for me, this, I mean, this, this was totally different. 
I, I tried, I tried to hack her voicemail. But... I was with fucking Vodafone, the network was down, I had no service, it was total bollocks. Vodafone, proudly doing our bit to stop phone hacking in Britain. Inside of the wheel, where we zoom right into a recent media story and break it down bit by bit. Yeah, now, of course, Julie Gillard, as we said earlier, celebrated her 50th birthday this week, which naturally led to the question... Well, the Prime Minister is celebrating her 50th birthday today, but could it be many happy returns to the top job for Kevin Rudd? Hence today's topic, ridiculous leadership speculation. No. Obviously, in order to have a leadership challenge, you need a challenger. And, and look, uh, hats off to the media. They've really narrowed down the options of who's set to replace Gillard. The calls for Kevin Rudd to make a comeback are growing louder. Or it's Stephen Smith. Or Simon Crean. Or Chris Bowen. Will... I'm standing by my tip that Chris Bowen is Chris the most Bowen. Known. Or maybe we'll have two Prime Ministers, Bill Shorten with Greg Combay. <laughs> or, failing that, the surefire team of Bill Shorten and Mark Butler, whoever he is. Or e even likelier still, though, Malcolm Turnbull from the opposing party. <laughs> or a man who retired in 2007, Peter Beattie. But I think, I think the most likely candidate was recommended by this caller to Andrew Bolt on the radio. Morning, Anthony. Um, Mr Bolt, look, I have to tell you... Um, I, I find you refreshing, understanding, you should be running for Prime Minister. OK, so what do you fill up the news with while we're waiting for Prime Minister Bolt to take over? <laughs> Thankfully, the media is very good at making it sound like a lot's going on, even when nothing's actually happening. The heat is on. Speculation is rife. The Labor Party is buzzing with talk. Speculation months. The rumour mills in overdrive. The speculation is mounting. There have been mutterings. Tensions rise. Rumblings within the Labor Party. Fingers of blame are being pointed all over Canberra. <laughs> in fact, we've even gotten to the point where nothing happening is a story in itself. Look at this caption here. Numbers not being counted. <laughs> <laughs> Amidst all the guesswork, at least newsreader Alicia Gorey finally had some concrete information. Surely if there are reports, though, of rumours that there is talk going on in Canberra... Yes, reports of rumours of talk. <laughs> I've heard reports of rumours of talk that that might be pathetic. <laughs> but who are the actual people? behind these reports of rumours of talk. Well, I'm not sure exactly who's starting them, Jez, but they all seem to be rather senior. OK, we've got senior Labor figures, senior government figures, senior power brokers, senior players, senior sources and senior Labor sources. I mean, it's true. Australia's seniors are fonts of information about who the next leader is. Psst. My tip for Prime Minister is Mark Butler. <laughs> Whoever he is. OK, so, so far there's no actual information whatsoever, but... A few weeks back, there was a story that got kind of close. Her numbers up. Claims Labor MPs are deserting Julia Gillard with Kevin 07, nine votes from Kevin 11. At last, information. See, Rudd was exactly nine votes from the leadership. He was, at least until we opened up the newspaper and found he was within five or seven votes. Or within five or 11 votes. And then back on TV... He said he only needs seven votes and he's Prime Minister. So it's five, seven, nine, or 11 votes. <laughs> I wonder where our senior power brokers got those numbers from. <laughs> Bingo! So in summary, unnamed seniors heard reports of rumours of talk that someone, anyone, could be any number of votes from the leadership. Yeah, but, I mean, what about all these accused leadership usurpers? Like Mark Butler. Like, sorry, who's he? I don't know. Anyway, I mean, you know, what about these people? Don't they have anything to say in their defence? Oh, it doesn't matter what they say, Andrew. Like, take Kevin Rudd, for instance, right? Now, we all know he probably wants to be leader, but what's the guy actually supposed to say? Even when he categorically denies any moves to challenge Gillard, it gets reported like this. Rudd said he fully supported the Prime Minister, but did not use Miss Gillard's name. Gotcha? Well, I mean, he could have been talking about the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Clearly. Well, look, that just confirms the challenge is on, obviously, but you can't just say Gillard's in trouble. You need to show she's in trouble with photos of misery. Yes, here they are. Look, Gillard blinking away the tears of regret. Gillard praying for absolution. And look, Gillard buffeted by the winds of unpopularity. Yeah, the wind photo proves it. She is going down. And when someone's down, you know what you got to do? you got to give them a kick. Well, after the break, why the nation's redheads have disowned Julia Gillard. Why does the Prime Minister wear those little blouse things that come and stick out 
over the hips like that. From the back, she looks like a semi-trailer with the right-hand signal on. Hmm, I wonder what Ray Chesterton looks like from the back. He looks like a fuckwit who's facing away from you. The senior power brokers have finally gotten something right. This week on Q&A, join our panel of guests answering your questions on a wide range of topics, from the carbon tax... If everyone is compensated for the carbon tax, where is the incentive to change behaviours? ..to the carbon tax. Is the proposal for a carbon tax coming from the real Julia? ..with a surprise question from the floor on a topic that no one will see coming. My partner and I have been living in a homosexual relationship for the past 14 years. We share a house and a love equal to that of any other person. So can the Prime Minister please tell me, why can't we have a carbon tax? That's Q&A, the live and interactive forum where you get to ask the question. The same question, week after week after week. Carbon tax. Good evening elsewhere in the news this week. Police have expressed concerns about a new viral internet craze known as standing. The craze involves people or standers uploading photographs of themselves standing in a variety of upright positions. So far, no one is believed to have died in a standing incident, but police fear it could only be a matter of time. Nine people have died in Spain's annual running of the serial killers. Brave tourists flock to Spain once a year to see if they can outrun the country's most notorious psychopaths, but not without a few spills and upsets along the way. And a birthday blooper for Hollywood veteran Clint Eastwood. Friends and colleagues had organised a skywriter to spell Happy Birthday Clint over Los Angeles. But unfortunately, due to strong winds, the words took on an unsavoury shape. That's the news in brief for this week. They say if you have an infinite number of monkeys, you can write the complete works of Shakespeare. If you have one monkey, you can write a sequel to The Hangover. But to create a news story, you need a call centre full of people conducting a survey. That way you and your PR firm can... Create newsworthy statistics. But what is newsworthy? Hey boss, this study just came in from a gourmet sausage company. What does it say? It says people like gourmet sausages. Really? Stop the presses! This survey about sausages was deemed newsworthy by the Mercury and the Daily Telegraph. And once it's in the telly... New research has been conducted for Snag Stand. Located in Westfield in the city. You even get Alan Jones mentioning your brand without paying him. Almost unheard of. I love sausages. We know, Alan. But what if your product's not as newsworthy as a sausage? What if you want to promote something boring, like a finance company? In a survey conducted by Virgin Money, 79% of Aussies haven't fulfilled their childhood dreams. That is so true. Channel 10's Ashley Brown wanted to be a journalist when she grew up. But she had to settle for this. So Richard Brands, would you like to come and have a chat with us and tell us about your dream? My dream is to get dressed up and promote my companies on the news by making up a stupid survey about people not reaching their childhood dreams. What do you think this would mean to somebody if they were given this opportunity? About, uh, hundred grand of free advertising. And the great thing about everyone doing surveys is that now you can just make up stuff that sounds like a study and still make the news. People are apparently getting out of the living room, getting out of the games room, leaving the Wii and the Nintendo behind <laughs> and going, going boating. Peter Harvey's not just saying that because he's at a boat show, it's well researched. Let's have a listen to some of the people that you've had a chat to this morning as well. They're, they're happy to take their, their families away from the technology of the Wiis and the Playstations and all the electronics and bring them together as a family unit on a boat. See, he spoke to one person that morning that just happened to be the marketing manager for the boat show, who just happened to say the same thing. I am convinced. Dad, can we go back home and play Wii? No, shut up. Everybody is doing this, OK? Enjoy it. <laughs> the news in Japan from Reuters. In Ishinomaki on the coast, survivors remember the city's more than 3,000 victims and 700 missing with a moment of silence. The news in Japan from Channel 9. And then this, 13 dogs in Japan now hold the record for the most canines on a skipping rope. Yes, 
welcome to the Shemries, the media industry's most prestigious awards for excellence and integrity in online journalism. Each week we're going to be looking at a different aspect of online news sites and in our final show we'll be awarding the Golden Shembury. Ooh, thank you, Horace. There we go. We, we'll be awarding that to the news site that's done the most to set the standard for what online journalism has become. And uh, with the footy finals just behind us, the online world had a field day in the lead up to the big games. In fact, on the day of the Brownlow medal, the Herald Sun had not won. Not two, but 33 items about it on their homepage, including, strangely enough, Brownlow pretty boring, actually. <laughs> but by contrast, the Telegraph showed us that the people of Sydney have a slightly different interest. What, the, the rugby league? Not quite. In fact, the most read story all weekend was nude calendars, nipples are out. Sydney people are so classy. <laughs> Nipples are out. Now, that is classic clickbait if ever I saw it. But sadly, for any jizzed up men who pounced on the link hoping to see some nipple action, this is what they would have seen. <laughs> some kind of New Zealand tourism campaign ad. <laughs> Don't worry, Chris, their jizz didn't go to waste. Because that article in The Telegraph also led to another nine whole galleries of nudie calendars. Which leads us very nicely to our first category in the Shembury Awards, the online news item which links to the pissiest, almost pointless photo gallery. A hotly contested category. Now, first runner-up goes to Adelaide Now, who thought a story about an X Factor contestant who once worked at Hooters was the perfect chance to run a photo gallery of random Hooters girls. Not just any gallery, Chris. A gallery of 81 photos <laughs> capturing the full range of girls in a series of newsworthy poses. Next up, a well-deserved nod to The Telegraph for their story about how the rain was causing train delays. And in case we didn't know what a train delay looked like, bang, a 13-photo gallery capturing all the drama from inside a delayed train. And outside a delayed train. It was unbelievable pictures. Our final runner-up deserves some kind of prize for possibly being the dumbest photo gallery ever. It comes from The Telegraph's confidential pages. And it's a gallery of... Celebrity fat faces. 100% hypothetical photoshopping, 100% pointless. We've got George Clooney with fat cheeks, Paris Hilton with fat cheeks, Carl Sanderlands with fat cheeks. Oh, no, no, that, that's not photoshopped. That, no. that is Carl Sanderlands. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he, he's a fat fuck. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it does bring us to our winner tonight, a gallery which just edged out the others because it comes from a website that, frankly, should know better. Yes, the Huffington Post has a reputation for quality, which is why we were completely baffled when, for no apparent reason, they ran this gallery of random celebrities eating ice cream. Yes, <laughs> Camilla Parker Bowles eating ice cream, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Jerry Seinfeld, until after a while they actually ran out of ice cream and just started showing celebrities drinking milkshakes. <laughs> so the very first Shembury of 2011 goes to the Huffington Post. Woo! Uh, oh yeah. Our sincere congratulations. Mr Murdoch, you've made no secret of your desire to be majority owner of B-Sky B in Britain. What about closer to home? Would you like to fully own Sky News here? Yes. Is there any limit to your ownership ambitions? Would you, for instance, like to buy Fairfax? Yes. Channel 9? Yes. Channel 7? Yes. The ABC? Yes. Even ABC 2? Yes. The Jewish News? Yes. Greedy Old Fogey Monthly? Yes. Greedy Old Fogey Monthly Gay Edition? Absolutely. Is there any paper or publication which you wouldn't wish to be associated with? The news of the world. Crime! It's scary when it happens to you, but when it happens to someone else... It's awesome! That's why the news loves covering crime reports. Excuse me, guys, can you get off my porch? My wife was murdered this morning. No, but don't you realise the first rule of crime reporting is that you must stand outside the victim's house for as long as possible. See? Oh, my mistake. 
What better comfort for a family whose mother has just been murdered than to have a film crew stationed outside their house at 7am? Well, we're joined by 7 News reporter Cameron Boak. The mother of three is dead. And at 8am. Now, there are no charges at this stage. And at midday. On this occasion, the weapon was a knife. And still there at 5pm. They believe it's simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unlike Cameron Bode, who's in the wrong place every time. The second thing every crime report needs is a forced interview with a reluctant neighbour. Reluctant neighbours are good, but hassling the grieving husband is even better. Just like the privacy respected, that's all. He wanted his privacy for the morning news, but maybe the evening news will have more luck. That's all I've got to say at the moment. Bugger! Always remember, as a journalist, you're giving a voice to the people who are hiding from you behind their doors. She had nothing to say when we knocked on the door of her home, which is currently up for sale. Yeah, I understand, but I just want to give you the opportunity of saying something. Yes, opportunity knocks at 2 a.m. Next, do you mind wrapping up now? We're just giving you an opportunity. Oh, my mistake. The next rule of crime reporting is you must capture distant footage of the victim's roof. Not only is it great TV, but the soothing sound of the chopper blades will help heal their grief. No wonder more and more psychiatrists insist on treating patients underneath helicopters. Next, you must help the police to keep people calm. Police are trying to appeal to everybody to stay calm. By reassuring them, like this. Tonight, John Ibrahim's Sydney mansion shot up, sparking fears of a deadly family feud. Good evening. Police fear a deadly street war may erupt in Sydney suburbs. <laughs> Ultimately, Crime News is a community service. Street war! Street war! It can warn you about online miscreants. Police say they found phone messages from the username Freeman Free Big Balls. Lucky for the news, or I would have immediately friended him. And it can even help you catch criminals yourself. We are releasing it in the hope that members of the community may recognise these people, or that the people may recognise themselves and provide their details to police. With the suspects clearly identified, they were rounded up and charged. All thanks to the news. And also thanks to the news, despite the fact that homicide's gone down for the last 15 years, this is the number of people who think crime is dropping. Hello! Is anybody here? So thank you, News, for keeping us alert and helping keep scumbags like this off our streets. The search is on for a crazed stalker seen lurking outside crime victims' houses. Police have released footage of the man, known online as Cameron Bow Bald Ball's tiny penis. A random neighbour had this to say. Fuck off. And five minutes later added this. Just fuck off. Police are appealing to people to stay calm, even though you're all going to die. Uh, 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 um, uh. And so our first spin of the wheel comes to an end, but if you ever miss an episode, you can always catch up online at our website, which is abc.net.au forward slash hamster wheel, where you can also take part in our weekly game, Where's Horace? It's, uh, it's a bit like Where's Wally. Horace <laughs> the hamster is hidden in one scene of every episode of the show, so make sure you keep a close eye out for Horace next week. Uh, to find out... <laughs> no, not this Horace. He's smaller. To find out where he was hidden tonight, you can find the answer on our website. We'd also love your insider tip-offs or anything else you come across in the media that you think deserves the hamster treatment. So until next week, in the words of News of the World, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>